Okay, so it's been about two weeks since I spoke with you guys, and quite a lot has happened since then. So before we get into today's events, I'm gonna catch everyone up real quick. And pretty much what's been going on is I've been on the most absurd poker heater of probably my entire poker career. Granted, I've only been playing around two years, so not the biggest sample size, but still big enough that a 14 session win streak is quite remarkable. If this is the equator for running good, I've been like way up here, right? And what's gonna happen when you do that for a long period of time is eventually something's gonna happen called reversion to the mean. And that's actually a topic I learned from an Andrew Nimi vlog a few years ago. And pretty much all that means is that if that equator is here, you can't run here or here for too long before eventually you revert back to the mean. Now that's gonna happen either very slowly or very quickly. And for myself, it was very, very abrupt. And it was last night at a Morongo 510 game where I bought in for $6,000 and cashed out for $2. So definitely a session to forget about and quite a way to end the run good streak. Nevertheless, I woke up this morning wanting to get right back on the horse and play some more 510 at Morongo, but unfortunately it's not going today. So I found the next best thing out here in the desert and that is 2-5 no limit, $2,000 cap. Probably the biggest 2-5 game I've ever heard of. And it's right here at home in the desert, Palm Springs, well, technically Rancho Mirage, but pretty much Palm Springs. Agua Caliente Resort and Casino. Now, I've been here before on the vlog, but that was a long time ago, so most of you guys probably haven't seen this place. So for a lot of you, this will be a new property, and for myself, hopefully it'll just be a good day of 2-5 No Limit, which I have not played in quite a while now, actually. So yeah, that's it for today, guys. My only plans for the day were get some coffee, go to the gym, and poker. The first two have been taken care of, so all that's left is playing some cards. Let's go do just that. We are back at it here guys, playing some 2-5 No Limit Hold'em this time, in for $2,000, and in the first interesting hand of the night, there's three limpers before the small blind makes it $25. I'm in the big blind and I look down at pocket jacks, I make it $85, everyone makes the fold except for the small blind, so we're in position going heads up to a flop of 10-10-5 with two diamonds and one heart. When he checks it to me, I'm for sure going to keep betting, but no need to go too big since the board is fairly dry. So I make it $65, and surprisingly my opponent check raises to $200. Not exactly sure what he's trying to represent here since I doubt a 10 would play this way. So I'm thinking he most likely has a bluff, maybe a hand like pocket 9s or 8s that perceives my hand to be ace high and raises for protection. I don't really know. Either way, I feel like the best play is to just call, so that's what I do. Turn card is the seven of hearts, shouldn't really change much. My opponent only has around $350 at this point and decides that all of that is going into the middle as he announces all in. Fairly straightforward call here, so that's what I do. So we're off to a river card, which is the queen of spades. My opponent has the look of a man who doesn't really have much and indeed he shows ace deuce of hearts. So we scoop the first hand of the night, happy to get off on the right foot. In the second hand, the straddle is on, and there's two limpers before I look down at king-queen in the big blind. I raise it up to $50, and only the straddler makes the call. So heads up here to a flop of 7-7 seven, seven deuce, and very similar to the last hand, it's such a dry board. I make it $35, and my opponent makes the call. Turn card is very good looking, it's the queen of spades. So suddenly we go from having an eh type of hand to a very strong one. This is a spot where we should continue to bet most of the time, considering that the queen is going to connect with us more often than the straddler. However, I have the feeling that this particular opponent would bet if checked to, with a lot of hands that she probably shouldn't bet, or maybe overvalue some hands that we're beating. So I check it over to her, and indeed she does put in a bet of $130. At this point, she's only got $200 behind after that bet, so going all in feels like it's probably fine, considering that she's put in such a big chunk of her stack already. But at the same time, that will shut down a lot of bluffs that I feel like she could have, given how the hands played out so far, so I elect on just a call. We're off to a river card here, which is an innocent looking three. I check it over to her once again, but she checks it back fairly quickly. 
I show my hand and we beat pocket fives. So another one going our way. In the next hand, there's an early position limp before someone makes it $15. There's two callers in the field and then I look down at 8-7 suited in the big blind. Could mix between putting in a raise and just flat calling. This time I decided to just call and the early position player calls as well. So we're going like four or five ways, something like that, to a flop of 7-3 deuce with two clubs and one spade. Interestingly enough, once I check it, the early position limper leads out for $10. The original raiser calls. We see another call before the player in last position, I think he was in the cutoff or button, he raises it up to $50. Action's back to me and facing all this action, it's a little bit dicey to put in a re-raise. Folding also seems out of the question, at least right here on the flop, maybe later on, but for now I think the best play is to just call, so that's what I do. The early position player makes the call, the original raiser folds, and the player behind her folds as well. So very interesting development so far, a little bit confusing, but all you need to know is that we're going three ways to a turn card here, which is the jack of diamonds. Pretty much a break, unless someone's got like a jack high flush draw, I guess. Nothing to do but check though, the early position player checks, and once again, the player last to act puts in a bet. Except it's for $50 again, which was the same size that he raised to on the flop. Seems fairly weak to me, indicative of maybe one pair or perhaps a draw. And against most of those holdings, we should be in good shape and could actually get some value here through a check raise. Seems a little bit sketchy since our hand isn't that good, but against such small sizing, we should definitely have some check raises and this hand seems to fit the bill. So I make it 170 to go. The early position player folds and the player in late position makes the call. So now we're heads up going to a river card, which is a three of diamonds. And I gotta be honest, in this spot, I got a little bit confused because I feel like both options are actually fine. Checking with the intention of calling seems good since we would catch all the bluffs. But putting out a big bet also seems good because that's probably what we would do with a lot of our bluffs. And also it seems like we could be chopping some of the time since I wouldn't be too surprised to see my opponent turn over a 7 here. In fact, I wouldn't be too surprised to see him turn over a hand like pocket 8s or pocket 9s even since this player had been playing very passively pre-flop. So I think about it for a bit and decide that the best play is actually just a bet fairly large. I put in a bet of $500, but it looks like maybe checking would have been the better play since my opponent quickly folds and shows ace 5 of clubs. The very next shuffle, the straddle's on, there's two limpers, and I look down at queen jack in the small blind. Probably questionable to complete here, but I'm trying to film a vlog and the table had been fairly passive pre-flop. So I flick in the $10, the big blind makes the call, and the straddler checks it. So five ways here to a flop of ace, queen, queen with two hearts. I start off with the check. I feel like the best way to build this one is going to be through a check race, but no one takes the bait. So we're off to a turn card here, which is the seven of clubs. Once again, I'm going to go for a check all the way to the button this time, who thankfully puts in a $15 bet. Finally, we got a little bit of action. I raise it up to $65. Now a player in the field makes the call and the button calls as well. So happy to get called in two spots. River was a brick, honestly I forgot, but just an irrelevant card. Both of my opponents in this case only had around $150 behind, so nothing to do here but just move all in. The first player makes the call and the button gets out of the way. I show it down and we're good. In the next hand, yours truly is in the straddle, and action folds all the way to the big blind who makes it $25. I look down at 9-7 of spades, and I think you can mix between putting in a re-raise and just flat calling. This time I decided to just call, so we're off to a flop here which comes 10-6-3 with a spade. Big blind puts in a continuation bet of $15, and seeing as we have a straight draw, a possible flush draw, and a gambling problem, I think it's best to raise it up, so I make it $45, and he makes the call. Turn card's the nine of diamonds, he checks it over to me, and now that we've picked up a pair, I think it's fine to check back. Seems unlikely he's got a 10 or an over pair, so we're probably good to go here. But in case it wasn't too sure, we find a third nine on the river. Once again, he checks it to me, unfortunately, and I think this is a good spot to overbet because all possible draws breaked out, and there's really not a lot of strong hands that I would play this way. Raise the flop, check back the turn, and then bomb the river. Seems like a pretty bluffy play, so I feel like we're gonna get looked up light, I put in a $175 bet. My opponent thinks it over for a little bit, but no cigar. He decides to let it go. Later on, that same player opens to $25 before I look down at pocket eights in the cutoff. 
Once again, I think it's one that you can mix between raising and calling. This time I decide to raise it up. I make it $85. Action folds to the big blind who makes the call. And then the original raiser folds. Not really what I had in mind, but that's fine as we're in position and we're off to a flop of 10-10 deuce. Big blind checks it to me and much like some other hands tonight, this is a spot where I want to keep betting, but no need to go too big since the board looks fairly harmless. So I put in a $65 bet and my opponent makes the call. Turn card is the four of hearts and he checks it to me. Uh, and now I think it's close between continuing to bet and just checking back. Given how the hands played out so far, I think he could have hands like pocket nines, maybe pocket jacks, ace king, ace queen. And I think I'm happy to check back against all those holdings. Seems like it's gonna be much easier to just maneuver the river. So I check it back and we're off to a river card which is the six of spades. Fairly good run out for our hand and I feel even better about it when my opponent checks it to me for a third time. And you guys know I like to go for value more often than not but feels like it's likely we'll get called by better hands. I end up just checking it back and indeed it looks like there was really no value because my opponent shows king queen offsuit. Kind of a weird hand, but I'm happy to take it. In the next hand, action folds to me on the button and I look down at 5-3 of diamonds. I raise it up to $20 and get called by just a small blind. So heads up here to a flop of king 7-6 with two diamonds. So we flop a straight flush draw. He checks it, I put in a bet of $35 and he makes the call. Turn card is the seven of hearts and it seems like my opponent has been studying some theory because he decides to lead this card Interestingly enough, this is a fairly good play, although I'm not entirely sure if he's aware of that, but we've got a straight flush draw. So I'm not going anywhere just yet. I put in the call, lots of good river cards that could come out, and indeed we get one of those in the Ace of Diamonds. Now he slows down and checks it to me, unfortunately, and I think this is yet another spot where a big bet is the best play. If he's got a king, he's most likely just gonna fold, but if he's got a seven, it's time to go for some big value. So I put in a $250 bet, I've actually played with this opponent before and I think he thinks I'm full of it most of the time, but this time he does give me credit and ends up folding fairly quickly. After the hand, I was actually wondering if he saw my cards because if you think about it, he played it perfectly as if he did see my hand. He check called on the flop when we had five high, then he led the turn when we had a huge draw, and then when we got there, he just folded. Hmm. Either way, Mike Postle would probably be proud of my opponent's play here. Moving on to the next hand where there's an early position open to $20 before I look down at 9-8 suited next to act. I'm not really a huge fan of calling raises in early position because you kind of open yourself up to getting squeezed from some players behind you. Granted in this game it seems fairly unlikely but either way I decide to come in for a raise. I make it $70 to go. Now the big blind makes the call and the original raiser makes the call as well. So three ways here in a re-raised pot to a flop of ace 6-6 six, six with one diamond. Action checks all the way to me. I'm definitely not gonna be betting into two opponents here, especially considering that the big blind doesn't really look like the type to be in the mood for folding. However, the turn card definitely changes things. It's like we handpicked it out of the deck. It's the seven of diamonds, giving us a straight draw and a flush draw. And I guess once again, we've got a straight flush draw, right? Anyway, this time the big blind leads out for $150. Early position makes the fold, and now it's back to me and we have a decision between calling and maybe taking the more aggressive route of just ripping it all in and trying to get my opponent to fold a hand that he probably shouldn't be betting. Maybe an over pair to the seven, but lower than the ace. I know this is a bit of a reach, but keep in mind that I'm being very specific to this exact player who, again, I don't think this would be out of the realm of possibilities. So given that we haven't had any bluffs today and so far I've just shown down good hands all day, I decided to take the aggressive route Probably a little bit spewy, but come on, let's have a little bit of fun, right? What's not fun though is getting snap called when you're putting in a bluff. So plan A completely fails, but plan B is getting there on the river since we've got a good amount of outs. Not this time though, it's the four of clubs. Luckily my opponent shows quickly, so I don't have to show down this nine high. And he's got ace seven. Definitely was not trying to get him to fold top two pair, so nice hand, sir. Here's a double up. In the next one, I began filming on the flop because I didn't think much would happen, but boy was I wrong. There's three limpers and I look down at pocket fours in the big blind. I check it and we go to just a little flop of 10-4-4. Four, four. Right, okay, so I'm gonna start with a check, but sadly the action checks all the way around. 
That's alright, plenty of time to build this pot later on. Turn card is the Queen of Hearts. Fingers crossed that someone's got a Queen. Once again, I check it, and the action checks all the way to the button, who is the player I just doubled up. Thankfully, he puts in a bet. He makes it $15. I raise it up to $85 now, and he makes the call. So we get to see one last card, which comes out the Three of Clubs. Now, given that I just bluffed this opponent, I feel like he could perceive me as very angry, which... Obviously, I am extremely angry, but what that means is we can probably get away with a huge bet. So I throw in $300, trying to make it look bluffy. He thinks it over, thinks it over, weighs the options, and eventually decides on a call, despite the obnoxiously big size. Obviously, we're winning this one. I show it, and uh, the rest of the table does like a little celebration, which I didn't really do anything special. I don't know. Anyway, moving on, there's two limpers, and I look down at ace nine of hearts on the button. I raise it up to $30, and now the small blind makes it $60. <sighs> Action folds back to me. On one hand, we're obviously beat here, given this exact player. On the other hand, it's 30 more. Uh, I call. Seems very likely she's got a big pair, so probably looking for an ace or some sort of monster draw. Ace 10 8 is just fine by me comes rainbow she does like a really slow check seems fairly obvious to me now that she's got like kings or queens maybe jacks and she doesn't want me to bet and that's fine by me i'm more than happy to check it back here since we're probably way ahead or way behind turn cards the nine of diamonds so now we turn two pair but like i said i don't think we really needed it this time she decides to jam 130 dollars i make the call River's the queen of spades, which is a little bit dicey because I feel like she could easily have queens, but she has jacks, so we're good. Oh, wait a minute, that's a straight. How embarrassing. I show my hand thinking that we're good and didn't notice that any jack made a straight. <laughs> it's been a while since that happened. What a rookie. Anyway, nice hand, miss. Guess it's only fair that in the end, jacks be ace nine. And that, ladies and gentlemen, takes us to the last hand of the night, which is actually my personal favorite. I look down at Queen Jack of Spades in middle position and make a standard open to $20. The cutoff makes the call, and now the button, who is a player I've played with quite a bit, she's fairly solid, doesn't get too out of line, and is thinking about the game. She puts in a re-raise to $125. Now the big blind suddenly makes the call with a $500 stack. That's pretty interesting. The action gets back to me, and at this point I'm looking at the button stack, and she's got around $1,500, so despite the raise being fairly large, there's just so many big blinds left to play for, and that's kind of why I like coming out here to play 2-5. You're just so deep that it's almost always fine to call, right? So that's what I do, and now the cutoff makes the call as well. Four ways here in a re-raised pot to a flop of queen 9-7 with two spades. Wow. But when the action checks to me, I'm just going to check it over to the Razor. And she puts in a continuation bet of $250. And at this point, I'm actually not in love with the situation. Because are Ace, King, and Jax continuing to bet on this board? Definitely not. Especially into three people. So, since we can eliminate those hands, we're actually behind. Yeah, we've got a lot of equity with top pair and the flush draw. But... Given how the hands played out, I actually think we're behind here. It seems very likely she's got a hand like aces or kings. So when the action gets back to me, I elect to call, but keeping in mind that we're probably looking for some help here. The cutoff makes the fold, so it's just me and the button going to the turn card here, which is the 10 of clubs. At this point, the pot is around $1,000, and I think I actually want to turn my hand into a bluff here and get maximum fold equity from an over pair. Given that we pick up an open-ended straight draw, and this board is just so scary for an overpair to call off, I decide to move it all in. She's got around 1100 behind, so just over a pot-sized shove, and eventually she lays it down. Now, we actually discussed the hand later on. She actually told me she had black pocket aces. Happy that we were able to correctly assess the situation, and even more so that it ended up working out. Anyway, that was the last hand of the night. At this point, I'd been there for around seven hours and it was getting a little late, so I decided to rack up and call it a night. Hope you guys enjoy the hands.
They've got this somewhat absurd rule in the poker room here where if you get up to go get food, they pick you up and you get put back on the list. If anything, I feel like that'll just discourage players from wanting to play for a long time, but that's just one idiot's opinion, right? So I'm starving, but on the bright side, I won quite a bit of money today considering that it was a 2-5 game. Even just not losing feels great after the previous session, which I mentioned earlier in this vlog where I got killed at Morongo. A couple of announcements before wrapping it up though. I will be going to Texas and Cleveland both next month in April. Texas is gonna be the first week of April and Cleveland will be around the 21st, I believe. In Texas, I'm not entirely sure where I'll be playing. I think I'll be at the Lodge and probably Texas Card House as well. As for Cleveland, I'll be playing at Jack. So for those of you guys who are familiar with those two areas and perhaps your locals, you wanna go grab some of my chips in your local card room, I'll be there next month. Those are the two trips that I'm looking forward to now. It goes without saying that I'll be vlogging there. So for those of you guys who are not familiar with those locations, you'll get to see it all through the vlog format. And that's a wrap for today, guys. As always, thank you so much for your support. Thank you for watching if you made it this far. If you gave it a thumbs up, you know I appreciate that. It helps the channel grow. And I'm gonna go get some food because I'm starving and also freezing my ass off out here. So I'll talk to you guys next time. Until then, good luck at the tables. Peace.